This is Pastor Nathan Willard, Yankee United Church of Christ, and we're almost done with First Peter. You know, when we started this, it was just going to be a quick blitz through a book that a lot of us don't take time to read um, very often. doesn't come up super frequently in lectionaries, and if you want to learn more about lectionaries and about sort of the good and bad of that, we'll have a, a sermon on that this Sunday. Uh, I know it's a weird thing, but it's it's all part of our ongoing practice of, hey, let's read through more scripture. Let's see what this thing, the Bible, that we claim is the center of our worship and our Christian life actually says. I didn't really expect to have a moment where the pastors of First Peter would come up of nas- and be of national relevance, right? This is just a book I haven't spent so much time studying and want to offer something a little bit up on that. Um, and so it's important now that we sum up where we are. The final passage of First Peter uh, sort of the last five verses, is a classic closing. I have written and sent these few lines to you by Sylvanus. I consider him to be a faithful brother. In these lines, I have urged and affirmed that this is the genuine grace of God. Stand firm in it. The fellow elect church in Babylon greets you, and so does my son Mark. Greet each other with a kiss of love. Peace to you all who are in Christ. And so here we just, it's just a farewell. Um, as it turns out, it's a farewell that has caused some scholars a little bit of consternation. There's a lot of talk when you look at the scholarly uh, study of this book saying it doesn't sound like Peter. And so a lot of people have put weight into this. Maybe Sylvanus, his scribe, changed the wording. And maybe it was dictated by Peter, but Sylvanus uh, dressed it up. I'm not going to get into that today. I do want to sum up, though. So we've gone through this entire book, right? We've gone through this entire book, and we've seen these things about obedience and about suffering. And it's a reminder that there's a clear context here of going to a particular group of people who are having particular pains um, as a minority group in a largely unchristian city, uh, people who, for whom it may be illegal not to go to worship um, other gods, uh, people who are suffering indignities because uh, they are Christians, um, and think also that because they are Christians, you know, they should not be treated the way they are. And... Uh, The author is is saying, hey, look, you've got this context that you're in, and and it may not be in your power right now to make all the changes you think you ought to make, to make all the changes you think we, we, we should make. Be aware of what power you have. Exert the power that you have, the power of relationship. Try to show through your own actions the good things that you could be doing. Uh, have all this power and use this power um, to do good. Never do evil, even though you are listening maybe to people you don't agree with. Don't lash out in anger. Don't uh, do the things that you are forbidden to do because uh, they are evil and they are harmful and they cause suffering. And remember that when you are trying to get by, when you are trying to get through this day, when you're trying to exert what power you have and suffering is caused because of the good that you are doing, know that you're not alone. Know that in the middle of your suffering, Christ is there with you also as Christ was on the cross and Christ continues to be with us. This model uh, gives us hope that even in the midst of suffering, maybe there will be an end to the suffering. That just as Jesus' suffering ended with resurrection, we may too. And so it's this message throughout it all to keep the faith to keep it up, to keep knowing that even though things are not going well now, we do have power in our lives, and we do have the power of choice in our lives, and we can sometimes exert that power in good ways. At the same time, we know that there's limitations on the applicability of this, that we can't just take this as a standalone book, because Peter is writing into a context, and he does tell us, right, he does tell us that when we have authority, when we are rulers, we should be humble in it. Um, that we should not uh, rule over another person. So we understand that um, when we do have power, there is a model there for us, that we're supposed to model that relationship, that care for one another, that mutuality. We're supposed to remember, too, that as we suffered, when people who are actually oppressing us in their power are um, are uh, causing us suffering, that as we gain strength from the message that in the end of times when Jesus comes again, they will be judge wanting. It's a warning to us that we should not expose ourselves um, to that same judgment. So that's the overall message here, right? That we have things we can do and we have power, recognize our power, act uh, out of the good, um, do not lash out in anger, Um, But it's not a blind obedience to one another. It's not a thing that happens um, in all times and all places. Like there's very specific meanings behind the things that Peter is uh, asking the followers to do. And we should always be aware 
of where we fit and is this context applicable to us or not. And that's the thing always remember in the letters, but especially in this one, whoever wrote it. This is Pastor Nathan Willard signing off on 1 Peter. I think we might just go through 2 Peter next. Um, it's a little apocalyptic, uh, but it is a thing also that gets even less play than 1 Peter. And so hopefully there will not be massive comets causing death and destruction on us next week, um, but I can't promise anything. This is Pastor Nathan Willard, Inca United Church of Christ on June 11th, 2020. Signing off.